As the street lights blinked on, Jane Goldman stepped onto her front porch to listen to the faint sound of screaming float from the other houses on her street. The screaming was the sound of children protesting everything, eating, bathing, sharing toys, going to sleep. As the weather warmed, she stood outside on her porch, smoking a rare cigarette and listening. This was her life now, at 40. She had married a man whom she admired and loved, and after the initial confusion of early marriage, the fact that they betrayed the other simply by being themselves, they fell into the exhausting momentum that was their lives. They had produced a son, now five years old, and a daughter, now eight months. Two beings who hurtled into the world, ruby-lipped, peach-skinned, and who now held them hostage as surely as masked gunmen controlled a bank. <laughs> Jane was a freelance editor for technical ma manuals, and her husband, after seeing his business as a high-priced website designer dry up, settled into a job as a consultant. They had moved to a mid-sized city in South Carolina. It was not their first choice, and they did not know if they would ever feel at home there but they could afford and finally have a small house as well as a car. They had found their own happiness, weighted by resignation that they were who they were, that they would never truly know the thoughts of another person, that their love was bruised by the carelessness of their own parents, his mother, her father, and that they would wander the world in their dreams with ghostly and tangible lovers, that their children would move from adoration of them to fury, that they and their parents would die in different cities, that they would never accomplish anything that would leave lasting marks on the world. They had longed for this from the first lonely moment of their childhoods when they realized they could not marry their fathers and mothers through the burning romanticism of their teens <clears throat> to the bustling search of their 20s. And there was the faint regret that this tumult and exhaustion was what they had longed for too, and it would soon be gone. Jane stood on the porch each night, watching the, dot that, watching the dusk settle onto the street. And when the screaming had ended, she sat watching the other families move behind the windows, gliding silently in their aquariums of golden light. One morning soon after, Jane sat cross-legged on the floor of the bathroom, the baby grappling at her breasts, and watched the line form on the test. She and her husband had not been trying for another child. She pressed her lips to the baby girl's soft head. This one she wanted to love, and she understood clearly that she did not feel capable of loving a third child. She had given everything to the others. She kissed the baby's head, grateful for the aura of kindness the baby bestowed upon her. For now, there was no illusion, as there had been when she was a young woman, that this being inside of her would not become a child. She held the thick, muscular result in her hands. The baby's tiny fingers made her feel faint. They lived in a part of the country where a third or fourth or fifth unexpected child arrived, and with jovial weariness, families made room for them. She looked at the red line and it measured all the moments remaining in her life. The husband staggered awake after a depressing dream in which a childhood friend had retired early and moved to Tuscany. <laughs> the kitchen smelled fetid as though an animal had crawled into a corner and died. The boy, still grief-stricken over his sister's birth, utilizing their guilt over this to demand endless presents, described his longing for a slinky that another child had brought to school. I did want it, he wailed in a monotone. I did, I did, I did. He wanted to wear his Superman shirt with a red cape attached to his shoulders and spent his breakfast leaping out of his seat, trying to shoot his sister with a plastic gun. She too already had preferences and screamed until Jane put her into a purple outfit with fluffy bunny ears. They wanted to be anything but human. Her husband could not find anything to put on his lunch sandwich and with a sort of martyr defiance slapped margarine on bread. What a man does to save money, he murmured. <laughs> well, why didn't you buy your lunch, she asked. Do you know how much that costs, he said. Do you know how much I'm saving this family by eating crap on bread every day? <laughs> Get me a slinky, the boy yelled to everyone. The baby screamed. Will everyone please shut up, she said. 
Ben flinched, embarrassed. Don't say that around the children, he said. I can say what I want. Don't say shut up, the boy said in a ponderous tone. Eat your breakfast, she hissed at him. I hate it, he wailed, writhing out of his seat and moved onto the floor where he curled up under the table as though preparing for a nuclear bomb. She glanced at her husband. Their love had been, like all love at the beginning, a mutual and essential misunderstanding. <laughs> a belief that each could absorb qualities held by the other, that each could save the other from loneliness, and that their future held endless promise. That they would not be separated by death. This version of joy was what they had chosen of their own free will. The baby, not wanting to be outdone, suddenly struck a pose like a fashion model. How cute, said the husband, for they all hungered for a moment of beauty. The baby laughed a glittery sound, and the boy wept. <laughs> the future lay before them, limp and endless. The husband got on his knees by the sun. Come now, he said, his voice exquisite with tenderness. You're a big boy now. He pleaded for maturity for five minutes, and when his voice was about to snap, the boy crawled out, donned a backpack, which made him resemble a miniature college student. He turned around delighted, so they all applauded. Their son ran out to the lawn. There was sweet green freshness in the morning air. It was a Tuesday. She believed she was six weeks along, and there was a bad taste in her mouth of ash. Behind them was their house, a flimsy tribute to the middle class. But one bad car crash, one growing lump, a few missed paychecks would send them packing. They could not afford to have a heart attack or to lose their minds. It was just spring and daffodils burst out of the cold earth. She and her husband stood bewildered, watching the children dance in the golden southern sunlight. She loved them so deeply, her skin felt as if it were burning. And she also knew that her love, which she had thought contained boundless wealth, could be handed out to dozens, hundreds, at its finite limits as well. She called the babysitter, kissed her children goodbye, and went to the clinic. She was afraid that he would have tried to convince her to have the third child. She wept on the way there for her certainty that she could not have another, for her desire to be good enough for the boy and girl. When she arrived at the clinic, she had stopped weeping. She drove home, sore and cramping, three hours later, down the broad gray lanes bordered by fast food emporiums, wanting to swerve in and run inside to the high school girls in bright hats behind the counter so that she could hear them brightly say, may I help you? Sometimes during the day, there would be a knock on the door and there would be the eight-year-old neighbor, Mary Grace. She was the only person who was ever at the door. <laughs> she was beloved by their son, and for this reason, Jane let her wander into their house at all times. Mary Grace was fiercely competitive in all areas, including height, hour of bedtime, and the quality of bribe her mother had given her in order for her to get the flu shot. She had thin brown hair, and her eyes were hooded with the suspicion that her parents would do anything possible to keep from listening to her. Mary Grace's parents were silent, mysterious types who were very involved in their Baptist church. Jane and her husband tried to guess why the parents never spoke to them and why they were never invited um, their son to their house. Perhaps Mary Grace's father was having an affair or the mother was having an affair. Perhaps they never had sex or had bad sex. Perhaps they did not make each other laugh. Perhaps the mother was sad because she wished she had become a ballet dancer, a doctor, a rock star perhaps wondering too much. Perhaps he wanted to live in Australia. Perhaps she hated his taste in clothes. Perhaps one of them had cancer. Perhaps they did not want to get their floors dirty. Would they break up or marinate in their sourness for years? Mary Grace's parents did not set up any sort of social life for her. Jane noticed the wife spending most of her free time snipping their front hedge with gardening implements that were large and vicious. Jane saw the husband on his dutiful evening walks around the block, his eyes cast down, his feet lifting in a peculiar way so that he seemed to be tiptoeing across ice. Mary Grace scuttled over to Jane's at least once a day, 
neatly dressed and clean, but always with the demeanor of someone who was starving. That day, she was grateful for the girl's knock. Jane had returned from the clinic, clinic and opened the door to her home slowly, as if she were an intruder. The children noticed nothing. Their absor absorption in their own crisis was complete. They saw only that she was their mother and fell toward her. She was aching and exhausted, but the babysitter couldn't stay. Jane needed a stranger in the kitchen, someone to speak, because she could not. Let's make a magic potion, Mary Grace announced. She believed touchingly that she could realize her great dreams in their home. The girl rushed into the kitchen, her greedy hands rummaged through drawers, plucked juice boxes from the cupboards. We need to make magic potion. We need olive oil, lemonade, baking soda, seltzer. Yes, her son said, gazing at Mary Grace. Jane brought the items over and Mary Grace poured them carefully into a glass. Her son was now whispering to her, his face intent, and the girl said, rolling her eyes, no, it will not make you into a cheetah. Jane looked at Mary Grace. He can become a cheetah if he wants, Jane broke in. Then I want to become a princess, said Mary Grace. She brought them some vinegar and mayonnaise and seltzer and watched them stir their concoction. <laughs> Mary Grace looked up and said, My mother's doing a fitness video. She wants to get to her high school weight. <laughs> oh, said Jane. She was going to become a fitness instructor, but then she was dating my dad, and they knew each other three weeks, and then she dropped everything to have me. <laughs> she giggled frantically, as though she was not sure what sound to make. Then Mary Grace grasped Jane's forearm. The girl's nails were long and sharp. Can we add perfume to make princesses, she asked. Jane allowed the girl to hold her arm for a moment. No, she said. She patted Mary Grace's hand carefully. I'm sure she's very glad she has you, she said, and reached up to a cabinet for some baking soda. Mary, Mary Grace released her hand. Well, then she had my brother like that, boom, and then my sister, and she says if she gets back to her, Scott, her high school weight, she'll look 17 again. <laughs> Mary Grace took the baking soda, poured it in, and the mixture began to fizz and rise. The children shrieked at the possibilities implied in this, and when the potion puttered out, she looked towards Jane. More, called her son. I want a snack now, Mary Grace said. Jane opened the refrigerator. She felt more blood slip out of her, sharply took a breath. Do you want some carrots, she asked. I want ice cream with hot fudge syrup, said the girl. <laughs> Please. In Boston, where Jane used to live, her husband had a successful business constructing corporate websites but he most enjoyed helping people create elaborate personal shrines that floated in no place on earth. People wanted all sorts of things on them. Personal philosophy, photos, both personal and professional, diary fragments, links to other people whom they admired but to whom they had no connection. Her husband understood their desire to communicate their best selves with the unknown, invisible public. A shy person, he had forced himself to become sociable and liked convincing people of all the intimate facts they needed to tell strangers about themselves. When they met, he was exuberant, and she was disdainful of websites. She was the only person he had ever met who did not want one for herself. Don't you want people to click and find out all about you, he asked, your achievements and innermost thoughts. He was leaning on one arm against a wall, clutching cheap wine in a plastic glass. No, she said. He sensed she was holding back, and that made her appear to conceal something deeply valuable. She admired his shamelessness, the way he could go up to anyone at a party and convince them to create a monument to themselves. They had both stumbled, stumbled out of families in which they felt they did not belong. She, second of four, he, oldest of three. He had a beautiful, careless mother who had left the family for two years when he was seven. This created in him a sharp, first practicality, a need to ingratiate himself and to hoard money. She had been belittled by her father for years and had cultivated the aloofness of the shy. The economy quickly broke apart their life. People and companies were running out of money to create themselves in an invisible space. 
She had been working as an editor for a small publisher, and that was the first job she had lost simply because the company was folding. Their rent was shooting up, they were in their late 30s with a three-year-old, another on the way, and nothing saved for retirement. It was time to move on. Her husband came home that evening in a cheerful, determined mood, armed with a new digital camera. He wanted to take pictures of them in the garden and arrange them on a website that would record the children's growth as well as that of various vegetables and flowers they had recently planted. The, the routine quality of his new job sometimes filled him with a manic, expansive energy. So many parts of him were unused. The camera had cost $345. We can do this every few days, he said. We can tell people about it. They can click from everywhere and see our garden. We can start a trend, he tried with difficulty to arrange the children beside the pot of dirt. She did not want him to take a picture of her. She did not want to see a picture of her face on this day. We need more good pictures of you, he said, irritation flickering across his face. I look tired, she said. No, you don't. You need a picture with pearls holding a rose, Jackie Kennedy, a socialite surrounded by her darling cherubs, he laughed. Oh, right, she said. It was a sweet but cliched worldview that he reverted to when he felt uprooted, and it comforted him. He had nurtured it when he was alone and neglected as a child and formed his idea of happiness, what his family and love should be. She had been the daughter of nervous parents who cut up apples in her lunch so she would not choke and drove only on the right side of the road. And she had been drawn to his point of view when they were dating. She remembered the first time she saw his childhood house in a suburban track in Los Angeles. It was a small house that attempted to resemble a southern mansion with columns on the porch and a trim rose bed in the front. There was something in the stalwart embrace of other people's taste that made Jane envious not of the house so much as the purity of longing. She heard the children shriek and there was no such simplicity. Your own family was the death of it. Come on, he said, throw something on, wash your face. She looked at him. What's wrong, he asked. She did not want to injure his perception of himself as a good person, but she knew that now at night, he clutched his pillow as though he were drowning. Her family stumbled around the barren garden, hair lit up by the late afternoon sun. He was clutching his camera, eager to record the physical growth of his children. Look, she said to him, wanting him to see everything. The children were in bed, sleeping. She brought blankets to their chin, watched their breath rise in and out. Their eyelids twitched from fervent dreams. The sight of her children sleeping always brought up in her a love that was vast and irreproachable. No one could question this love. Oh, she remembered the first time she and her husband hired a babysitter and went to dinner. Two months after their boy was born, they'd walked the streets 10 minutes from their home. They had hoped that when they sat down in a restaurant, they would enjoy the same easy joy of self-absorption. They realized slowly they would never in their lives forget about him. The rest of the date they spent in stunned silence, understanding for the first time, how this love would both nourish and entrap them for the rest of their lives. She sat beside her husband in bed. She was still cramping. She went to the bathroom to urinate, and there was still blood. She was relieved as she felt the blood leave her, pretending it was just another period, but did not want to look too closely at the material that came with it. The names they may have used came to her, Charles, Wendy, Diane, but they were names for nothing now, air. There was no kindness she could offer it now, and that made her feel dry, stunted. She went to the children's rooms and kissed them again. She could not sleep. She sat in the darkness when she noticed a light go on in her neighbor's house. Their houses were side by side, about 10 feet apart, and the neighbor's blinds were usually closed. Tonight she saw they were open, as they were trying to enjoy the new warmth. The mother had put up curtains, but they were sheer, and Jane could see right into their room. She saw Mary Grace's mother sitting on her bed. Ah, their bedroom had been decorated with lukewarm blandness of a hotel room. 
and it was so clean as to deny any human interaction inside it. The mother wore a frilly aqua nighty that made her resemble, resemble a large clumsy girl. She was sitting on the edge of the bed and so suddenly pulled the nighty over her head. She was watching the husband who wore bright boxer shorts and no shirt. The curtain lifted in the warm wind. The husband walked over to the wife and she lifted her face for a kiss. The husband pulled her breast as though he was milking a cow. The wife's face was blank. I know what you forgot, the detergent, she exclaimed in a clear voice. The husband drew back, his shoulders slumped as though he were begging. There was a quiet and then Jane waited for his answer. Sorry, he said. There was a plaintive quality to his word. His inability to come up with any sort of excuse seemed to designate everything about their future. The lights went off. She got out of bed and went downstairs. She told herself she needed to take out the garbage, but she just needed to get outside. Opening the door, the night was thick and black and the air was fresh. She threw the bag of trash into the can and stood in front of her house. The cicadas sounded like an enormous machine. The sky was a riot of stars. She glanced around the empty street and began to run. Oh, the neighborhood was beautiful at this hour. Flowers and bushes randomly lit by small spotlights as though each family wanted to illuminate some glorious part of itself. It was 10.30 and the only discernible human sound was the canned television laughter floating out of windows. The houses looked anchored to those neat green plots of land. How long until her neighbors wake up, shower, eat their cereal, argue, dress their children, weep, prepare dinner, sit by the television, make love, sleep? She ran quietly, the sidewalk damp under her naked feet. She smelled the flowers, the jasmine, honeysuckle, man magnolia, sweet and ferocious and dark. She ran one block like this and stopped breathing hard. Her forehead was sweating. She was a middle-aged woman in her pajamas running from her house at 10.30 at night. Looking at her house, the small nightlight in her son's room cast a lovely blue glow through the window. From here, the room looked enchanted, as if inhabited by fairies. Her breathing slowed and the night air felt cool in her lungs. When she glanced up to her neighbor's bedroom window, she noticed that their blinds were now shut. Mary Grace knocked on the door at 3.30 the next day. Jane thought she was dressed up early for Halloween with a short blue accordion skirt and a t-shirt with a halo made out of rhinestones. It was actually a cheerleader outfit. She was going to go to practice for Halo Hoops, the church basketball team. I have to go to our basketball game at church, she said. I have 10 minutes, that's all. Jane held open the door and Mary Grace jumped inside and did a twirl. Can I marry you, Mary Grace? Her son asked. No, said Mary Grace. I'm older than you. She looked at Jane. I'm going to be a superstar singer. I'm going to be in the top five. Want to hear? She belted out a few words of a pop song. She was stocky, tuneless, and loud. <laughs> Jane's son was enchanted and requested more. He grabbed Mary Grace's hand and... Jane's heart flinched. Can we make cookies, Mary Grace asked. Quick! They bustled into the kitchen and proceeded to bake. No one came to take the girl to Halo Hoops. The kitchen suddenly smelled like a bakery. Mary Grace, Mary Grace stood too close to her. Do you like my singing, she asked. Sure, said Jane. Me too, said the girl. Jane felt Mary Grace's breath on her arm. The girl's breath had the warmth of a dragon or some other unnatural beast. The girl's belief in Jane's worth was awful. You have pretty hair, said Mary Grace, reaching up to touch Jane's hair. The girl had a startling gentle touch. Her hand smelled of sweet dough and chocolate. Thanks, said Jane. The boy and the baby stared at Mary Grace. The baby, hanging on Jane's hips, reached out and swatted Mary Grace away. Mary's grace face, face tightened and aggrieved. Well, do I have pretty hair? asked Mary Grace. The baby yanked Jane's hair. Ow, said Jane, grabbing the tiny hand. Do I? asked Mary Grace. It was almost a shout. 
Before Jane could answer, her son, her son stepped forward and grabbed Mary Grace's arm. Do you want to stay for dinner? he asked. Mary Grace recoiled from his touch. Jane saw all the girls' self-hatred light up in her eyes, that she had no other friends beside this five-year-old, that her parents did not want her at their table. No, she snapped. Ick, why do you keep asking me? Her son dropped his head, wounded. Jane slapped her hand on the table. It made a clear, sharp sound. Then just go home, she yelled at Mary Grace. The children were suddenly alert. Jane was frozen, ashamed. The girl slowly picked up her jacket and, shoulders slumped, eyes cast downward, trudged to the door. A position already so well worn, it had carved itself into her posture. Her son screamed, stay, and skidded towards her, arms open. But Mary Grace moved to the door and was gone. That night, Jane sat beside her husband and realized that they had known each other for 15 years. She wanted to tell her husband something new about herself, something she had never told anyone before. She wanted to tell him a secret that would bring them to a new level of closeness. But what could she tell him? What would be more grateful for a humili what would be more grateful for a humiliating moment in her life or a transforming one? Did people love others based on the ways they had similarly debased themselves? <laughs> or the proud ways they had lifted themselves up? What? he asked, sensing a disturbance. <laughs> I yelled at the girl. She was mean to our boy and I couldn't stand it. I shouldn't have. She turned around and left. They already hate us, he said, and returned to his book. She was now revved up for an argument. I'm wasting my life picking up towels. For every ten towels I pick up, you pick up one. I'm sick of it, and they, and they smell like goats. Now he looked up. I pick up towels, plenty of them. Not as many as me, she said. He jumped out of bed, standing on the balls of his feet like a boxer who had been secretly preparing for this barrage, and grabbed a robe and tossed it over himself. Ugh, oh, what do I give up for this family? Look at this leg, he held it out. If I had any time at all to exercise, then I would be able to get in great shape. I could run a marathon. I could make love ten times a day. The edge in his voice, the raw and bottomless yearning, was so sharply reminiscent of her own father during her childhood that she felt time as a funnel. She'd been emptied into her old home. Same person, but just a different size. He sank down into his chair and began to tap his foot nervously, looking anywhere but at her. We would have had a third child, she said. I stopped it. He looked up. This week, she said. She remembered the night she and her husband had brought their son home from the hospital. They had cupped him in their hands, a person just two days old. When he began to cry, his first human wails rising in their apartment, she and her husband realized that they were supposed to comfort him. It was them. They gazed with longing into his hopeful eyes. He stared at her. Carefully, he clasped his hands. His eyes were bright. She realized there were tears in them. Did you forget about me? He asked. His voice was soft, and it sounded as though it came directly out of the black night outside. We couldn't have done it, she said. You didn't want to, he replied sharply. You didn't either, she said. I know you. Do you, he asked. Look at me. What am I thinking right now? She looked into his dark eyes. When they got married, she wanted to know to own everything about him. She leaned toward him and looked closer. She and her husband were sitting beside each other, half-dressed, their windows open. She touched his hand. She thought she heard weak laughter in the neighbor's house, carried through the streets on a warm and fragrant wind. Mary Grace was back the next afternoon, washing up at their door as inevitably as the tide. There was something ancient about her, the way she smiled warily at Jane, scratching her leg, pretending that yesterday had not happened. 
She loved them simply because they opened the door. Could we make a lemonade stand? Could we sell lemonade for 25 cents? Jane moved outside. It was a cool day with drizzly rain. I don't know, said Jane, looking at the sky. But her son ran out the door, bubbling with joy that the girl was back. Yes, he yelled. He and Mary Grace arranged themselves around a card table in the front yard, a pitcher of lemonade and some cups between them. Mary Grace clutched an umbrella. Jane watched their small, dignified backs as they regarded the neighborhood, set in their belief that others would want what they offered. She did not have many plastic cups. She thought she would ask Mary Grace's mother if she had any cups. So she looked the woman's number up in the phone book. Hello, said Mary Grace's mother. Her voice sounded high-pitched and young. It's Jane Goldman next door, she said. Mary Grace is over right now, and I just wanted to say hi. There was silence. <laughs> well, the kids are having lemonade stand, and well, I, I wondered if you might have any plastic cups. She heard a sh deep intake of breath. Stop, said Mary Grace's mother. Excuse me, said Jane. You know that she knows that she gets sweets from you. She needs to lose 10 pounds. I don't want her to look ugly, do you? Uh, no, said Jane. Maybe she'd stay at your house if you actually talked to her. <laughs> I'm a good mother, said Mary Grace's mother. I keep her clean. She minds her manners. There was a sound of growling. At first, Jane thought it was the mother, and then realized it was the family dog. <laughs> Stay away from her, said Mary Grace's mother, her voice rising. Stop feeding her. Jane banged down the phone. Damn it, she yelled. She heard Mary Grace and her son laughing outside, and she knew it would be the last time this girl would visit their house. It would be his first grief, the loss of a friend, it would tip like a domino against the losses to come. Mary Grace would have her own disappointments with her sour and careless parents, and the families would live side by side until this particular race was over. Everyone, the children, the parents, were visitors on Earth. They were here briefly, then they would vanish. The children sat stalwart behind a plastic pitcher, the clouds broke apart and the sunlight fell upon them. She went and bought a cup for a dollar because she had no change. Others bought lemonade too with dollars and the children still had no change. And within an hour they had ten dollars. The children were gleeful at the unexpected riches. I will buy billions and billions of toys, her son screamed. The baby walked around in joyous circles. And they stood around the table, counting their riches over and over. Counting their riches over.